Fish at St. Mary's College of Maryland and an Aldum Plansion College professor. I probably pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry. And the director of the Voices <laughs> Reading Series, or not anymore. <laughs> Did I mess that up? You did okay. fine. Don't worry about it. I can't pronounce it either. Great, great. Um, and director of the Voices Reading Series. Karen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope you uh, are okay putting up with our shenanigans. Oh, yeah. It's so great. It's so great to be here. Thank you, Rachel and, and Courtney, um, for inviting me. Um, and I do want to mention my two book, um, the two books that I published are the most recent one's called Receipt and the other one's called Panishani. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you uh, for having me. Thank you so much. I want to thank Rachel and Courtney in particular for inviting me and um, take a moment to acknowledge the specialness of a seven year anniversary for the inner loop. I've I've run community and institutional reading series, and I know how much a labor of love it is to bring to people together every month for seven years to listen to work and share work. And I can see just from the banter what a great community you've constructed, which is so hard. I mean, that's that's an incredible amount of work. So um, not to mention the residency and the summer workshop and the support with books. I wish I wish I had had access to to all of that. In fact, I, I kind of still do. <laughs> so it's really, really awesome work that you're doing. And looking at the people that you've brought um, just this year, Tommy Pico and Toby Falern, but also the people who are reading tonight in the Flash series, it's, I feel very honored to be amongst such great companies. So thank you to Courtney um, and Rachel. I also, um, I wanted to just take a minute to acknowledge that this might be kind of a complicated day uh, for people given the Derek Chauvin trial. Um, while the verdict of the murder of George Floyd is, was the verdict was guilty, there's still, I think, a lot of grief and pain caused by continued injustice. And there's so much more work for white people like myself um, to do to make the world safe for black people. So, uh, so I, you know, both, both joyful, but also I wanna put this in this kind of larger context that we're in today. So I'm currently at work on poems about animals and plants that we categorize as weeds or pests or vermin. And my method is to research, um, research how organisms are classified as weeds or pests and then explore the ways that that kind of intersects with the logic of sexism and misogyny. And I'm especially interested in animals and plants that we're most disgusted by or ashamed of having in our homes or on our land. Um, and, you know, thinking about those kind of associations with women, like everything from rats to quack grass. So many of the familiar things that haunt our houses uh, and that we revile are feminized and kind of feminized as repulsive, like the black widow or the wasp or the mouse or the rabbit. Um, they're evil or insidious or sneaky or unthinking or uncontrollably reproductive. And their presence is often interpreted as women's failure to kind of control that space enough and keep it clean and hygienic. So I really, in these poems, I'm thinking about taking traits, um, performing that kind of critique, but also taking those traits assigned to vermin and weeds and women and thinking about new models for how to think about the non-human world and interrelate with the human world. So the six poems that I have for you tonight are, are all kind of in that category of thinking about those questions. Um, the first poem is about witch grass, which is a really aggressive, prolific agricultural weed, and it has lots of names, scotch grass, couch grass, twitch grass, quack grass. It reproduces super easily and it can clone itself from broken roots. So it's a dangerous kind of weed. But um, as you know, climate change makes weeds sort of more present. I was, you know, doing some research and also read about it being cultivated actively as a crop. So I've found a little seed of hope and healing in re-seeing these plants um, that are categorized as weeds. Witch grass. A child said, what is grass? Walt Whitman. Scutch, twitch, couch this witch kid. Don't tear her up. She's apt to rip you back, seed to stem. And look, you missed her twist and force herself through hard flesh. Push up the rocks you laid, each root you break, becoming a quickie self. Every hurt, now a field on fire with her. Leaves of ash, grass, and your damage, no crop, no cash. 
but stashed, she is a sweet stock, a winter's worth of food. You can't go back to the dull old good. Her bads, the stitch across the long green wound, you didn't know you had. Um, so my next poem is uh, about a verminous species that I got interested in because it has kind of its roots in this, in a sexist stereotype. So magpies in Greek mythology were created out of nine women who were really talky and naggy called the purities. And they were, um, they challenged the muses. And so for punishment, they were turned into magpies. So I, you know, I was thinking about that stereotype of just talking too much and nagging and complaining. Um, and at the same time, you know, magpies are an agricultural pest and there are lots of weapons used against them, like really with really great names like shell crackers and racket bombs and people use like pyrotechnics against them too. Even though they do, they can be helpful to fields too because they eat a lot of insects. So, um, so here in this poem, I'm kind of thinking about language as a weapon. Um, and as a way to try to make someone listen who is not listening. Magpies. Yet, though they now are winged, their endless need for sharp, impulsive, derisive speech remains. Their old loquacity they keep. And that's from Ovid's um, Metamorphoses. They're a loose flock, women a glock with the mind of a bad child and an eye for your scabs to pick. But I have a plan, a program, pyrotechnics, shows of force, traps and funnels filled with what they want, your face, your time, chunks of your brain, shell crackers, racket bombs, shotguns, effigies, something will get them to shut up and leave. They say they'll settle for your insects and waste, your wild mast. But look what they've done to your eyes and your mouth, filled them and drowned them, hungry, just waiting for you to use up all your threats and tools till only your ears are left. And I know fireflies aren't vermin, but <laughs> amongst fireflies, there is one called the femme fatale of fireflies uh, that's called Photurus, like that's the the species um, because, and she's called the femme fatale because she uses a chemical called luciferin to um, lure mates of other species. And luciferin is uh, bioluminescence basically. So it's like, you know, the, shi the sparkly stuff, the shiny stuff. So the Futurist lures the males, eats them, and then passes on their luciferin to her larvae. So kind of that, you know, that logic of like the bioluminescence passing through was really interesting to me. And I was thinking about the trope of the femme fatale, especially the older woman who is a femme fatale is kind of like coming, um, both becoming invisible and also um, kind of coming to the ideas around sexuality with more knowledge and experience. Luciferin, after Futurus, femme fatale of fireflies. Once or twice, I've been told I'm cold and older than I seem, that I suggest more than I deliver, femme fatally boring in the end, the wrong kind of thought and the right kind of clothes. But look at what these men want, a hole leading to a hole, a relief, a little death, an end, and yes, themselves all over, more of them, who wants that? I'm hungry, still living. I'm learning again, as I did when I was young, to go out in the correct brand of jeans, fireflying, the porous empath, bleeding on spec. Everyone wants understanding, a mirror to themselves, silvered, luciferin, whatever else I am. What they call deception, I call protection as they go on inside me, eaten, but glowing right through my body's wall. So next, rats. I kind of promised rats, so I gotta do rats. Um, this poem kind of thinks through humans through kind of a rat's perspective. I thought a lot, I thought a lot in this project about how we 
both are disgusted by some animals, but make their lives so good as if we were inviting them and like giving them everything they needed um, and kind of encouraging their populations. So um, this is a poem that kind of thinks about how um, we might be seen through rats' eyes as, you know, providing all the habitat and food that they needed, and also to, to try to guess what humans want um, by what we keep doing over and over and over again. Rat. For your cities, thank you. For your big noise. For the rain-glossed, thin-skinned bags of food. For the tunnels, the candy pink shell of your walls that we map by feel, by oil smear around you, the richest place in your house. For poison blunted, your undersink arsenal diffused and dead by overuse, by you, thank you. For you have been the sand to your own blaze. For you have been a gentle sentinel to us, letting us slip in around you, cryptic, slick. This is what we hope you'll take in for your pains. We'll stay. We promise, by your side at every step, like the guns you love to use till they're empty. Click, click. And I'm sure I will discuss someone with this next one, which is ca about cave crickets. People just love to hate cave crickets. They're those insects that are in basements and garages. They like really, they look kind of like crickets, but they have really long legs. Um, and they're also sometimes called spider crickets and they really freak people out. So um, they don't they don't bite really or have a sting or anything, um, but they do have this really interesting defense, which is that they they when they get backed into a corner, which they often are in your basement or garage or shed, they throw themselves at you, which is a kind of move like the last resort uh, against a predator. So I was super interested in that like fearful but still, collective and super effective form of action and defense when you have nothing less to lose. Cave cricket. Belly up, splay legged, bow backed to the things in the dark. My mother will die, my father, my kid. Licked with dread. What can I do when you smile at my limp and crawl, my see-through legs rickety and thin? What else is there to do? What else? With no sharp mouth, no poison, no blades or fingers, no bullets, think this. Fling myself from under the steps and there are more of us and more. A rush of sticky legs and heads so strange, so big with pain, so afraid it looks like fearlessness. And then um, for the last poem I'll read, uh, this is not, again, a true verminous species, not really any, you know, what most people would consider to be vermin. Dragonflies um, are actually a very popular insect, but I did come across these like interesting accounts of um, new attempts to use uh, implant chips in dragonflies and use them as spy drones. Um, their eyes are so large that they're actually like really well suited to that kind of usage. And I got very interested in the Western history of dragonflies as ill omens, like tools of the devil. Um, there's all kinds of really interesting myths about them that they served snakes, you know, that they have these kind of like demonic purposes. Um, and they have this kind of reputation of being both smart and malicious. And I started to think about all the uses that we put animals and plants and women to, both literally and figuratively, and how we might be able to kind of move outside that framework of what someone or something can be used for. Um, so as with the witchgrass poem, I start with some folk names of dragonflies that have like been, in, that are historical and kind of weird and interesting. Dragonfly, I'm not a needle, darner, devil to stitch you up. I'm not a doctor or a putter out of eyes, not courage or strength evil, weakness, I won't scare your horse, I never served an adder. I'm not your pain or your decor, your earrings, your brocade. I'm not your warrior or your girl waiting at home while you war. Not stronger than you are, not amazing, do not complete you. Not your mask, your faint, not your drone to watch with, 
your screen, not your brain to pick, your true north, your bright blue scrap of sky to chase, your muse. You've tried, but see my face? It's not for seeing through. It's for seeing more than you, all I. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing, Karen. Thank you. There are so many themes that just like I'm obsessed with. <laughs> I know. And I was like, okay, uh, somebody just put it in the chat, but I was thinking about the cicadas coming. Yeah. And, um, just how it's like haunting all of us. Well, anybody who's been reading about it like me. Um, so it just feels so appropriate. And yeah. I'm reading about bugs later too, so. I keep hearing all these, there's all these articles that are like, don't let your dogs eat the cicadas. It'll give them an upset stomach. <laughs> I'm like, is that a thing that we have to worry about? There's a great um, mixed meanings that compares, Gen it's like Gen X or Brood X, which is the cicadas. Ah, oh my God. And so in Gen X, I'm like, mm -hmm, you're right. <laughs> about all of it, we're just like cicadas, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Uh, our the last time the cicadas showed up, our dog that we had then, Gilbert, ate them, and uh, and he would throw them up, and he would often only somehow throw up the heads. It was. <laughs> was <a lot> <laughs> Couldn't digest them. Uh, oh well, thank you, Karen. That was awesome. Um, Dan, can I ask you to get some artwork up on the screen for us? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, just a second. While Dan is working on that, I feel like we forgot to do our little spiel chord about virtual. I know about using the chat and stuff. Yeah, I mean, most people remember, but anybody who feels timid, the chat is a good place to just put visceral reaction or anything that like jumps out at you because it you know readings are really great for writers because they get that instant feedback but you don't really get that in the virtual setting so the chat is a good approximation so feel free to just throw reactions in there and readers can read them after their reading does that uh pop up for everybody yes great um okay so this is not going to advance on its own it looks like um, so I'm going to uh, click through. Um, Courtney and Rachel, did, did you want the artist to say something as we, yeah, as we go through? Yeah, I would love for you to just give a little, a little shiny blurb about um, these couple pieces that you, you shared with us, if you are up for it. Sounds great. So this first one is titled Into Darkness. Um, I don't do a ton of drawings, but um, every now and again, I find it really meditative. Um, I mostly use like Sharpies, um, sometimes some colored pencils um, or play around with like watercolor or something. Um, but this one's mostly Sharpie, uh, a couple different colors in there, very celestial. Um, I usually, when I draw, start out just with a blank page and then um, kind of start dividing the page in different ways. So for this one, it was starting off with circles and then, you know, a body that was sort of cut in half. And then I just sort of went on from there. And uh, I usually don't start off with a clear direction, but then I find it along the way. So... Yeah. That's kind of how I, we, I think a lot of us, well, not always, but a lot of us feel about writing too. It kind of like finds us. <laughs> um, and also that's wild that that's Sharpie. It's so detailed. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Uh, this is a photograph um, that I took when I was working out in Yosemite one season, um, just down in the areas with all the, uh, the giant sequoias and saw this lovely uh, I don't I don't actually know I will admit I don't know if it's crow or a raven but definitely had some raven vibes to me so I titled it nevermore a corvid either way <laughs> <laughs> exactly. oh nice <laughs> and this last one um it's a photo in the background there of a sculpture in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris and then I overlaid it with um well, I was walking around DC one day and fancied this crack in a wall. So I uh, took a picture of that and put it over. And then the words over top of that um, are from one of my poems, uh, Perspective. 
And uh, you can actually find that on my website, which I think was linked in that PDF. So I encourage you to check that out. Thank you, Chris. Is there a, um, is the website the best place for people to find you? At my website and then also I'm on Instagram, uh, marks in the sand with a period between each word, but Great. I can put that in the chat as well. Please do. Excellent. All right. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Lucinda, we've got some quilts to talk about here. Excellent. <clears throat> so this one is called Journey. And it was actually a gift for my son and his husband as they begin their marriage. Um, and most of my quilts are fairly small. And this one I think is roughly about 24 by 24 inches. Um, and they're all improv, which means I don't use patterns. Um, and I pretty literally make it up as I go. And kind of what Chris said about being meditative when you're sewing, um, you're, you're playing with razor sharp knives and fast moving needles. So if you're not paying attention, you're gonna have less fingers. So it's, it's a really great way to clear your head of you know whatever else is going on, which then gives you space to later sort of maybe come up with words for poems. So it kind of, they, I bounce back and forth between the two of them. Um, and I don't most, I don't have, um, right now I'm not making quilts that have messages. I'm making quilts because they're pretty and they're warm and they're cuddly and which means I've done a lot of that during the pandemic. <laughs> and this one um, is somewhat larger. It's about um, oh, 30 by 36 inches. And people tell me that it's much harder to make circles in quilts. Um, I don't use uh, anything to mark those circles. I freehand them and I cut them freehand. Um, which is why, the, you know, they intentionally don't match up. But um, for me, circles weirdly are easier than straight lines for squares and triangles. I don't know why that is, but my circles work out better. So I kind of partial to that when I'm uh, quilting. But this was actually the first one I did that I floated the border, um, which meant that and rather than having the border right at the edge of the quilt, I sort of added a little bit so that it was... The, the black became the background as well. And I've been doing a couple of those since. And they kind of, when you see it in person, it's um, tends to be kind of more three-dimensional that way, which I really, I like that effect. So that's really about it. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say it really pops off from the background. That's very cool. Yes, um, thank you. And we shared Lucinda's website in the chat. Um, two. You yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm a teacher. So every summer I start to think about what sort of theme I want for the coming year. And um, I uh, spent a lot of time this summer thinking about um, Breonna Taylor and um, George Floyd. And so uh, my first poster that I painted that was a floral painting was a Say Her Name poster with all the names um, of um, women. Um, and so um, from there, I started painting Black Lives Matter posters, and I offered to paint them for free uh, to teachers to put up in their classrooms, um, especially since we were all using Zoom backgrounds <laughs> um, uh, to give them away. Um, and then people started wanting to donate money um, for the posters. So um, I still donate all proceeds of any posters that I sell to BIPOC serving nonprofits. And I've raised about $15,000 so far um, and I've painted over 200 posters. So these are a couple of examples of them. And um, I try to use florals um, that are significant to what I'm trying to say. So, um, with the violence um, against Asians, um, I chose a very traditional um, Chinese peony, um, a flower that is often used in um, traditional Asian art. And so I made uh, this stand up for AAPI poster. To what kind of paints do you use? They have this awesome kind of chalky quality to them. Yeah, they're, um, they're gouache and acrylic. So, um, yeah, so the I like the watercolory blending of the gouache and, and the acrylic gives it that really nice opacity and brightness. 
Awesome. Dan, I think there's one more on there of twos. Yeah, there we are. And I have to say thank you um, to the Interloop because I did a residency a couple of summers ago and I got to spend time up um, in beautiful landscape with lots of flowers. So uh, I, I got to be a poet and a painter and artist. And so I've always been really inspired um, by, by nature um, and visual art as well as poetry. Yeah, so typically um, uh, we, we've we had in the past at our, our anniversary events just um, strict strictly visual artists or, or people who have worked primarily in the visual arts display um, artwork. And this year when we put the call out, everyone was both a writer and a visual artist. I thought that was so cool. Um, so very excited to have you all. Thank you too. And last but not least for our visual art tonight, we have Benny Heron. Hello. Hi, Benny. How are you? <laughs> Hanging in there. <laughs> oh, so you want to know about this? Yeah, um, tell us a little bit if you feel like it. <laughs> so it, um, I, uh, I just paint and just do stuff. And this is called Broke King. Um, I just liked it and kept going and I, yeah, it's acrylic and oil and um, I spilled some paint on the floor, on the ground and a car on the carpet. My wife wasn't too happy about that. Um, yeah. It has I a like very it. Basquiat feel to it, Benny. <laughs> yes. Um, Do you hate I, when people say that? <laughs> No, hell no, no, heck no, can I say hell, can I say, can I say hell in here? Yeah, yes. Hell no, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that, that, that's that, and my wife thinks it's scary, but, you know, I like it. I mean, to each other. Yeah, it's a, it's a little, you know, it, it, it gets you a little bit, but. You know. Benny, where can people um, see more of your work if they want to? Um, you can go to, I actually have a website um, called uh, BennyHeron.com, just my name.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Little Benny, um, one um, spelled out Little Benny, uh, O N E. Um, yeah. I, I, Thank I, you. <laughs> Awesome. We'll yeah, I, was gonna say, I think there's another one. Yes, there is. Um, and this is a little homage to one of my favorite mediums, uh, hip hop. Um, if you look on the um, on the right below the eye, that's um, Grandmaster uh, Theodore. Um, oh, excuse me, that's Busy B. And then to the right is Grand Wizard Theodore. And for those that don't know who Grand Wizard Theodore is, he actually invented scratching. He invented scratching. Um, so they're both um, forefathers of hip hop. So if you know anything about the, the, the history of hip hop, one of the stains, the sayings back then was hip hop, it don't stop. You know, so I just kind of put it don't stop in the in the head. <laughs> Again, my wife doesn't really like this one. Um, he think she thought I painted Eminem. I'm like, no, it's not Eminem. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, not that there's anything wrong with painting Eminem, but I'm like, that's who you see? Like, really? Um, but yeah, so Busy B, for those that don't know, he... Um, had an infamous battle with um, another forefather of hip hop, Kumo D, and he kind of, that that battle, Kumo D and Busy B, kind of changed the trajectory of hip hop music as we know it today. Um, created the the music that we know today because before that battle, most MCs, most rappers, just simply rapped about the DJ behind them and how good the DJ was and how much the party 
was going to get rocking and how much they could control the crowd with their with their words. And uh, when he battled busy, when Kumo D battled Busy B, he targeted Busy B by talking about him. And ever since then, that's kind of what people do. Um, they threw, talk about threw down the gauntlet. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Benny. Um, That's it. Cool. Oh, oh, one more. One more. Yeah, one more. <laughs> um, yeah, and this one is, um, is again, just layered, multi-layered. It's acrylic, oil, um, some spray paint in there. And I just kind of went for it. Um, just had some fun with it and let it come to life. Um, I put a, a crosshair in there, um, sort of off target. You you, you missed. Um, yeah. Um, nice. I love the fire over his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, very cool. Well, we've been putting the, our artist work in the chat um, or their websites and, and Instagram handles. So um, y'all can go ahead and, and look them up and, and talk about, you know, investing in your art collection if you, if you so desire. <laughs> um, I know personally that's been kind of a goal of mine to um, buy one piece a year and I try to seek out local artists. So um I'll stop talking about that now. Um, <laughs> Jan, you can stop the screen share, please. And yes. um, right. we will we will get to the reading, the, the flash reading portion of this evening. How's everybody feeling? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> are you just feeling it? How, how are the cocktails going? Anybody? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> strong. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, um, let's do this. All right, so I'm going to try and spotlight everyone um, in order of the program here. Um, are we are we calling off anyone's name, or are we just going to go one by one? I think we... Sorry, Rachel, what were you going to say? I was going to say, well, we could probably call the names. Normally, yeah. we don't, but it's pretty easy virtually to just throw the name up. But Dan, you can just go straight to the person. We'll see the name. Nice. Okay. All right, Rach, it's all you. It's all me. It's all Dan. I mean, <laughs> we're going we're gonna we're gonna to start with Kaylee McHale, all right? Here we go. First yeah. poetry, Kaylee McHale. Hi. All right. So I'm going to read a poem called Like a Breathing Tadpole. I used to think I was a tadpole mother. I used to think I was swaddled in a too hot blanket and I shivered and shook, propelling my body through the sweat and water to the shore. I suffocated until I opened my eyes and could see my own chest rising, falling like a tadpole mother, like a breathing tadpole. I tried to resist imposing order on the universe by instead allowing it all to wash over me as a cold, good current my back on the rounded rocks, my hair sliding away, my face just below the surface, my lips just above. Are you proud of me, tadpole mother? Did you see me grow my legs? Did they blossom like ripe fruit, like bursting time between blossom and fruit? Like a fat tadpole who burst, mother, at its own unhappy and faded seams? Now, both of us on our bellies, sister, both of us floating in space, both of us with both eyes and two feet and not much else calculable besides the breath that fills our little lungs, two breathing tadpoles, a quiet but not silent miracle, two bodies ready to burst full of arms and legs and vestigial tails and so many hopeful eggs warm from all the crowded limbs inside their thin walls inside us. I don't remember everything, but what I do is technicolor. The way my mother held me with two hands. The way my two small hands gripped her shoulders as I rode on her back. How she jumped with strong legs from ragged wet outcropping to cool reeded corner. When my brothers and sisters and I crowded around the opening of a hot spring 
our tails retracting at the same rate as our legs grow long. And I wondered what other precious parts of myself I may lose as warm bubbles break like eggs around us. Thank you. Next in fiction, Beth Konkowski. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is called Offshore. When Amanda was 12, she lost $20 from the pocket of her shorts while pedaling a squeaky paddle boat through the knotted weed bed that made up Prospect Lake. She didn't even know it was missing until late in the afternoon when it was time to hang out at the rec hall for buckaroo pinball, pistachio ice cream, and foreigner on the jukebox. The only money she had to last a week, and it was Monday. But I warned you, said her mother, her mouth a scolding line of lipstick, the color of a bruise. Warned you, echoed Nana, from the trailer screened in shadowed kitchen where they stood, lost in their cigarettes, pulling corn and dead lobsters from gigantic pots. At dinner, her tears wet the vinyl tablecloth, and she swung her legs, kicking up dust and gravel from a seat on the picnic bench, shaking Nana and Papa who sat on each side, their piles of cracked lobster shells growing. Finally, her mother sent her away so civilized people could eat. After dinner, they called her back outside where she slumped in a lawn chair, ignoring the fire and Papa's trick of lighting a match with a hatchet. She heard only the jukebox, its pulse the call for kids to gather to make their way out of the family sing-along and endless games of Michigan rummy. Her only dream that summer was to join the group of teenagers who shared their french fries with too much ketchup and wrote their initials on the rafters in black permanent marker hearts. She might have just made the fringe of their group by midweek if she'd had the money. Amanda, come here. She turned to see her father near the woodpile, a finger to his lips. He handed her a 20 pulpy and wet. I found it, he nodded to the lake, offshore. And she ran, never thinking until years later of the bill pulled from his water wallet and dipped in evening waves. Thank you. Next in poetry, Courtney LeBlanc. Thank you, uh, Rachel and Courtney for inviting me. I'm gonna read a poem titled To My Ex Who Asked If Every Poem Was About Him. And it's in my forthcoming book that's on sale this month. So I'll put the link in the chat. I wish you happiness, but the kind that makes you think of me after your wife has fallen asleep. I wish you 2% raises and average performance evaluations. I wish you casseroles and Bud Light. I wish you vacations to Disney World in July. I wish you khakis and plaid button-ups. I wish you sex, but only missionary position and only with the lights out. I wish you calendar reminders and capped teeth. I wish you individually wrapped low-fat cheese slices and turkey bacon, which insults two animals. I wish you mayonnaise and store-bought white bread. I wish you decaf coffee. I wish you sleeping in until 7 a.m. on Sundays. I wish you instant oatmeal microwaved each morning for your heart health. I wish you a tie each Father's Day and a birthday card received a week late. I wish you a daughter who writes poetry filled with metaphors about a complicated family relationship. I wish you a football team that never makes the playoffs and a son who's an average soccer player. I wish you this poem popping up first the next time you Google me. Thank you. That's amazing. Uh, it makes me think of Carly Simon. Uh. <laughs> so good. Um, okay. Next in nonfiction, me. <laughs> Rachel Coons, everyone. Yeah, introduce myself. Sorry. Okay. This is called Palmetto Books. We're moving to Gainesville. I'm finally getting out of this podunk nowhere town and I'm leaving all these losers behind. I walk down our street for the last time. I'm leaving this place. I'm leaving Highway 90 and the one square block they call downtown. I'm leaving Kurt's half pipe and all the skater kids. And I'm leaving our little ranch style house squatting under the oak tree that drips palmetto bugs into its walls. 
Palmetto bugs are all I know cockroaches to be, black and shiny, as big as my father's big toe, with wings that carry them to the tallest thing in the room, which is usually someone's head. I felt the silkiness of those wings when I pulled one out of my combat boot. I felt the tickle of their feet as one crawled onto my hand while I sat on the living room love seat waiting for Robbie in the dark. I felt the crunch of their exoskeletons when I accidentally stepped on them, sneaking barefoot onto the carport. But that never killed them. Killing them requires multiple direct hits with the hardest weapon one can find in the house, a hardback book or a hard-soled shoe. They lose power like a video game boss, the color in the life bar draining as they're pummeled. They can be sucked up in the vacuum, if it's a particularly powerful vacuum, not clogged up with animal hair, human hair, and dust. But then the vacuum radiates a warm smell of dead cockroach until the whole house is filled with what Lily insists is the smell of Dr. Pepper. She never touches the drink for that reason. Palmetto bugs terrorize us through the house, crawling up through crevices, swooping down from ceilings, occupying every dark corner. Lily and I hide under blankets when they scurry across the ceiling. We clutch each other atop a dining room chair when they scuttle underfoot. We scream, horror movie guttural cries of true terror when Stephen chases us through the house with one of their dead bodies in a dustpan. Even when they aren't around, I imagine them all over my body, creeping up my legs under the covers, crawling over my face at night with furry legs and tall, wavering antenna. Maybe they venture into my mouth, or maybe my ears, or worst of all, my hair, my long, thick hair. They get lost in there, fluttering their wings through the tangled weave of auburn strands, the red shimmering against their dark bodies. Their wings are pounding against my head to find their way out, but they get more buried the more they struggle. I can't shake the image. I can't shake the feeling. It's so real. But all of that is behind me now, now that we're getting out of Lake Shitty. Robbie rides up beside me on his skates. They still have palmetto bugs in Gainesville, you know? You may be getting out of here, but you'll still be in the swamp. I ignore him until he skates away and his silhouette no longer yanks at my chest. Yeah, right, I say to the thick breeze in his wake. I know the truth. Moving away means a fresh start. I get a clean slate. Thanks. Next in poetry, Lucky Lidecker. Hey, everybody. Nice with you congrats interloop um i just realized like two minutes is probably way longer than the amount of time that i'll take but hopefully someone else can just snap up those other 30 seconds or whatever so i'm just going to read a quick one um it's called samin nosrat tears up at a bite of pecorino and it's loosely inspired by samin nosrat the cook's show on netflix which you should watch if you want to be calm and hungry, which is something that I need a lot right now. Here we go. I've never seen anything so perfect. The crystalline crunch on her tongue is enough to wipe the taste of 10 unsatisfactory coffees from 10 new mouths. Oh, let the revolution be simple. Let it ferment and age and grow old. Such thunder, savory and final. It's not that I'm sad, but there are things worth fighting for. It's that every night I'm awake, mid-pandemic, overdue fires burning, my husband reaching for me in his sleep. Thanks again. And if you know Samin Nosrat, can you please send her this poem? Because I already tried on Instagram and she didn't respond. <laughs> Thanks. Next in fiction, Adam Schwartz. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be in this space with everybody's wonderful work. Uh, so I'm just going to read uh, uh, the first couple paragraphs from the first story in my collection, The Rest of the World. And the title of the story is Pavan for a Dead Princess. I think of that time before everything got crazy and I see Missy Ha like she was then. 19 with a heart-shaped face, teeth like fine china, and a little girl's giggle for something she knew that you didn't. Other girls tried so hard to make themselves look cute. Missy was pretty just because. And in that smile that stayed in her eyes, you thought you might see something better in yourself. 
They were Koreans, her family, with a carry out up the hill. You'd see their neon walk, throwing off samurai blades of sunshine, blinking out the words, democratic best, before you even got there. The Haas, most of them anyway, lived in the neighborhood, either above the store or next door. When you stepped up to order your food, the Haas weren't hiding behind some plexiglass cocoon, buzzing their own in and out. They took your order like real people, face to face, talking about whatever the sewer grate at the curb puffing rotten eggs again, or how nobody's giving Obama a chance, or that crazy 2012 movie that had some people so shook you couldn't tell them it was made up. Every June, they hosted a block party where they cooked out for the whole neighborhood. Hamburgers, hot dogs, lemons stuck through with peppermint sticks, and even short ribs if you went early enough. You'd smell the charcoal meat for blocks and you knew it was summer. In the fall, Sundays especially, they represented in purple Ravens jerseys, just like a lot of people. The one they call Unk with the spiky hair might even cross the street and take a rip of whatever was going around, Henny or Grey Goose, and then lose a few dollars playing spades in his checkered trim chef shirt. Everybody liked the Haas. They were good people, like I said, real people. But none of what I've told here meant they wanted Missy mixing with the customers. And that's what I was, a customer. Regular enough, they even called me by my favorite number, my favorite order, number five for the spicy yakimi. Thank you. Adam, I'm going to start calling you number five now. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> Next in poetry, Meg Eden. Hi. I'm going to read a, a poem um, from a collection that I'm working on right now. It's called Ars Poetica Loy Evitz. 1977, a girl is getting her watch adjusted, is buying an umbrella, is trying to hurry, her lunch break isn't long. She's wearing a blue hand-knit sweater, maroon slacks, wooden wedge shoes. She parks her car back at work. She should be safe now. Her new umbrella on the front seat, but she is gone. Her purse is found under a nearby bridge her husband still looking for her in every window. There is nothing you can say to reassure yourself that you can't become Loy. You can't say she is wearing the wrong thing, that she is in the wrong side of town, that she's out too late at night. She is my age. With her pencil thin eyebrows and Disney princess hair, she looks just like my mother. My mother who told me stories about missing girls, taught me how to not become a missing girl, held my hand in grocery stores, told me to never talk to strangers, but to hold my head up like the queen of England. The one time I remember her spanking me, it was because I walked too deep in the snow. She did this because she loves me, because she didn't want me to disappear in that snow into a stranger's white van. My mother's fear that I might be stolen pulses in my throat. What makes me different from Loy Evitz? Maybe I will live to be married 53 years. Maybe I will be found under a bridge, a forgotten Jane Doe. Maybe say it. I won't be found at all. Thank you. Mm. Next in nonfiction, Leslie Young. Thank you. It doesn't have a title yet. On the fourth day of New Year meditation challenge, my mother told me that she had breast cancer. We were lucky, they caught it early. Apparently there's such a thing as stage zero. The diagnosis was made two months ago and she had opted for a mastectomy. The surgery would be in four days. My mother had clamped her mouth through Thanksgiving and even Christmas, not wanting to further mar what the pandemic had already ruined. All she had asked for were soft button up pajamas saying the ones she owned chafed. I pored over material descriptions and reviews settling on a set in cheetah print that was described as lustrous and silky. The hidden truth was that she would need them during recovery. That, she told us proudly, was part of my trick. Through the screen, my mother's face was measured and deliberately serene, as if she were the doctor relaying news about the gauzy cluster in my mammogram. 
she was trying to control our reaction with her own to hold back her tears by making sure ours never fell. We obliged, more obedient than we'd ever been under her roof. On the eighth day of the meditation challenge, equanimity remained elusive. The air would get trapped in my chest and I couldn't exhale. I taught breathlessly. The minutes and hours painfully plotted until my sister called to say that mom was out and resting, that the surgeon reported all had gone well, that the part of my mother's body trying to kill her had been removed and would not succeed in stealing her from us after all. The teachings keep coming back to a simplicity that there is no good news and there is no bad news. Life is a series of events over which we have no control. Happiness lies in being unswayed by mercurial tides and by accepting what is particularly that everything is impermanent and no thing nor no one lasts forever. I think we begin grieving long before death in these moments where our temples briefly crumble and we are reminded that the cost of love is loss. Inevitable, however, is not the same as acceptable. For now, my mother still is. Thank you. Next in nonfiction, Leah Mehta. Hi, everyone. I'm going to read from my column, The Company We Keep. Into the Wilds, and also a homage to 495 metaphors. Maurice Sendak from Where the Wild Things Are said, there should be a place where only the things you want to happen, happen. Have you ever sat at a bar swirling a bourbon or watching your tea bag steep? That would be my husband. And felt like there is no place more perfect than the one you are at because you have a friend beside you who, like you, likes to write and wants to talk about it. That person gets it. The moment is delicious. Slogging away alone, this is one of the rewards of being a writer, to occasionally emerge out of your loneliness to be with that exalted creature the other writer. Writing dishevels you, and if you don't want it to conquer you, please find a community. It can be small and pungent, a few crackling chili peppers like you, but everyone needs a fellow traveler or they will go bonkers. If you write in Washington, D.C. and its environs, inside or outside the fabled Beltway, do find a friend to get you into the HOV lane someone true. It was a Sunday, maybe 2013 or thereabouts, when I headed to an open mic at the Writers' Center in Bethesda. I'd published poems and short fiction and was writing a novel. The wonderful Sunil Freeman manned the doors and inside I met Claudia Brown. Claudia wrote nonfiction and participated in the amazing This Is My Brave show, a performance-based multi-genre presentation on mental health. When I needed a buddy, Claudia was there for me. She even rolled up on the banks of the Anacostia River. I had been asked to read poetry as part of the flooded lecture series curated by Mia Fear. Public art has never been more strangely fantastic. Claudia and I canoed into the wilds of the Anacostia as the sun bailed on us. We steered our way past giant leafed plants in the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, temporarily on dry land. Claudia stood by me while I read my poem, Black Dog on the Anacostia by Torchlight. We were infamously featured in the city paper where a critic wrote, poets I learned aren't the best paddlers. A couple moons later, Claudia discovered the amazing inner loop. We went to see Molly McCloskey, who was one of my writing teachers. The Inner Loop founders, Rachel Koontz and Courtney Sexton, solid writers in their own right, have grown it into a multi-pronged literary establishment with a podcast, residencies, and more. Every day, I meet someone who reminds me of myself when I started in the city, someone who has a book to write, or maybe they are new to writing or new to DC. Maybe they're thinking, I'm all alone, or I have no time because I have to finish a book. Please be possessive of those hours to finish your book. But my experience has taught me that community has its own value. It is about feeling you are home, comfortable in your own skin. 
It is feeling grateful that there are other people out there whose work inspires you and who are willing to engage with your work. As you get out there, every now and then, may you find that friend who is willing to show up for you in the wilds of D.C. Or better still, may someone say to you, and I quote Maurice Sendak, Oh, please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. Thank you. Oh, how honored is that? <laughs> we love you too, Leah. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. <laughs> Next in Dan Knowlton. All right. Uh, this is from my novel that is still not uh, finished. And uh, it's in the future and in space. And that's um, all I guess you know, you need to know for this. Um, in zoology, I watched the jellyfish drift through their dark and blue tank. They reminded me of the archives images of excess. Rare materials refined at great effort for show and adornment. Their tendrils drifted like strands of silk hung from a jeweled chandelier. Beyond the tanks, other visitors strolled through the department's atrium in their tan and whites, peering through glass at fish, frogs, turtles, and snakes. This had been An's favorite place in all the ring. At least, that's what her parents had told me. Seraphin, thank you for contacting us. The voice of An's father startled me. He appeared to my right with one supporting arm wrapped behind An's mother. Their loss had not been kind to them. An's mother seemed smaller somehow as if the weight of her grief had compacted her body into itself. She couldn't meet my eyes and instead looked at me off center toward my shoulder. In your message, you said you had something for us, said the father, something of An's. Yes, I do. I held out a closed fist, concealing An's memorialized finger bones. You must understand, I, I shouldn't have this, I said. You shouldn't have this. An's father looked worried. I pulled my arm toward mine, gesturing as if we were to shake hands. I kept the bones hidden until I could press them into his palm. The father opened his hand just enough for him and his wife to peer at the object, and at the sight of the bones, An's mother came alive. Give that to me, she said and snatched at the bones like someone starved. She closed both hands around them, pulled her arms in tight, and brought her closed fists up toward her shoulder, pressing her chin down. She held on so tightly that it seemed she was trying to incorporate the bones back into her own body. On, she said, and her voice was a prayer. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth next. <laughs> Hi, um, this is called Brassica and it's the title track and the centerfold of what I hope is my second book. And I also want to say hi to my mom, Margaret, who's here because I know even though her face isn't showing, she'll be embarrassed and I love it. <laughs> um. <laughs> hi, mom. Okay, Brassica. One plant in the center of a spiral. Broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, cauliflower, kohlrabi, and collard greens. Brassica oleracea and its companions, Brassica rapa and Brassica nigra, of mustards and turnips. But let's just look at the one, the oleracea, the mother plant. Wild cabbage, with shallow branching roots and long leaves like fingers, knee height, scrubby, shrubby, in bloom, inflorescences buttery yellow. A mild, hardy plant, not too thirsty, resilient even in cold, finding sun even behind clouds. The care of humans did this. We looked at this plant and decided which parts we loved most. If we loved the leaves, we picked the plants with the biggest leaves, and thousands of years later we have kale, and we make fun of kale, remembering it only as decorative, snugged between greasy pizza at a pizza buffet, as if it wasn't such nurture over nature, as if we didn't pass our care through generations to bring these leaves here to us. Here is what we loved. Terminal buds became cabbage, lateral buds became Brussels sprouts, stems became kohlrabi, stems and flowers, such passion became broccoli, and the flower alone became cauliflower. This plant of human love, human patience, this plant, the best parts of what we can do, we loved and cultivated and loved, and then we all forgot. 
We saw each cultivar as its own plant. We joked about the similarity between cabbage and Brussels, the same, just smaller, not realizing how literally true that was. Brassica oleracea, wild cabbage, still exists, found on the sides of hills, defiant and steadfast in the hard ground. Brassica are resilient, not flinching in the face of wind and cold, keeping for months in a root cellar in, in winter a boon. Imagine a brown stew bright with green in the darkest part of winter. Imagine how it reminds us of the sun, of warmth. Remember how much affection brought us to broccoli at all. Broccoli, especially, a wonder. Most people like flowers can find beauty in a leaf, but the stem? Imagine seeing flowers and stem and realizing you want the whole thing. You need the whole thing. That was Elizabeth Deanna Morris Lakes. I feel like I didn't get to say your name properly. Um, next in nonfiction, Courtney Sexton. Hello. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to stick myself to my time limit too. This is um, an excerpt from an old piece about salmon and people and stuff. Okay, uh, it's part three, first ceremony. We are supposed to meet the caravan for a blessing ceremony at the Cheam fishing station. I'm with Ross and his beat up little sedan that is full of more shit, maps, hiking gear, and leftover supplies from a recent expedition than my 87 Benz was in college. His car smells like lavender because he doused it with essential oils before a date last week. Mike pulls in behind us in our very American rental SUV, our own little caravan. There aren't any other cars at the camp. We are early or in the wrong place. At the far end of the lot, of the lot, lawn chairs and a little grill sit outside an RV. A few meters out from the beach, two boats are chugging along. They are filled with boys, probably college kids, hollering drunkenly across the water, chasing and throwing around thousands of dollars worth of fishing equipment. We get out and begin to unpack gear. Even if we're not in the right spot, Mike will want to get a few shots of this view of the river. As we start across the gravelly lot, a long-haired man rounds the corner of the distant RV. A small girl dances by his side. He moves slowly and deliberately to, to the stand behind, beside a tree near the bank, eyes on the water, eyes on the boys in the boats. Ross searches for cell reception to find out where the caravan is, while Mike and I make our way over to where the stranger stands. His presence draws us toward him, the girl child, a quiet nymph, pulling us closer still. By now, the boys on the river are spinning. Their loudness bounces between tall pines that hold up the bank and those on the island. We're in the middle of a wide part of the river and it hurts to hear them, to see them. They've got aquatic cr crotch rockets. The Fraser is their city freeway. They are here. We introduce ourselves to the man, sensitive to the circumstances. We've practiced and adjusted our approach for each source. Each stranger we come upon may be able to color in the lines of our story just a little fuller than the last. Or a photojournalism team from the States doing a story on the Fraser, the salmon, their significance to BC and to the First Nations people. Read, we come in peace, we're not assholes. Sydney is a stolo elder. He's acting as camp warden for the season. The put in for the fishing boats is on what some Americans would call res property, First Nations property. So each season when it starts to warm up and the travelers start to come through, some from the, someone from the community volunteers to shack up for the summer to monitor the site. Yes, we're in the right place. Sydney's granddaughter looks at us curiously. Her short dark hair frames her face as she twists her body from side to side, holding onto the fabric at her waist the way little girls do when they're wearing skirts. The white boys on the river are still spinning loudly, aggressively. Sydney says they pay hundreds of dollars an hour to charter the boats, hundreds of dollars an hour to get drunk and chase the salmon around if there are any to be found. When I hear this anger and maybe violence simmers under the surface, I might crack out at any point, so I do not look the boys in the eye. I'm embarrassed and ashamed to be white because they are white and on this land that puts us in a box together our skin reflecting off each other and the water reflecting it back at us. Instead, I look up and out at the mountains that frame the Fraser, a perfect Hudson School painting, something familiar on this unfamiliar coast. The boys spin, the little girl twirls, three bright flags screen printed to tribal art, the open mouths and curved fins of salmon are tied to thin poles and cross each other on the beach, waiting to wave the caravan in. And I'm sorry, I went way over. We forgive you, Court. It's fantastic. 
next uh, in poetry, Indigo Erickson. Thank you, Interloop. Thank you, artists. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I wrote this last night. I was having a lot of writer's block, and then this happened. So, but then I got a little freaked out. So the title is Last Breath, but I wanted it to be clear what it's about. So then there's a parentheses of white supremacy motherfuckers. So <laughs> that's the title. Spoiler alert. <clears throat> I want you to breathe. Breathe. Breathe, breathe, breathe like fire, like life, like river, like flood. I want you to breathe and remember, remember to put together again. I want you to put together again, bodies shot, bodies burning, bodies buried. I want your blood to run like breath out of a man tasting delicate asphalt out of a child running into the night, wild with what could have been if you weren't there. If you weren't breathing a bullet into bone, I want you to breathe the promise of living, the promise of a false country, night drunk on itself. I want you to breathe lips pressed against fabric, breathe like belief, into the sky of science. I want you to breathe, your lips touching the dying lips of this bare freedom, your lips against the veil, a weathered fabric bruising your tongue as you breathe out and never are able to breathe back in. I want you to forfeit your breath for the bodies you left unburied, the sky you denied them, the ghost of a mother glimpsed at the edge as the world goes gray, goes red, goes black, like soil where trees grow into the sun and the poison of your breath transforms into space and the poison of your bones disintegrates and the poison of your being unbecomes, unmakes itself. I want you to breathe once more and know no more harm will come out of your lungs. Your breath belongs to us now. I lied. I don't want you to breathe. You stole the breath and we are coming back for it. Thanks. Mm. Thanks, Indigo. Next in fiction, Kira Wolf. Hi, everyone. I am also Instagramming snippets from everyone's reading. So if you haven't checked this out at, at the inner loop lit, please do. <laughs> I got you on this one, girl. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, this is something of a self portrait. A father is obsessed with reality television. A child sits with him, picks at its skin with uneven hands that can never be still watches. Blacksmiths slam mallets into iron with a force that soothes like rainfall. Soon the contestants will qu quench the blades in water, listen to them hiss. They are snake charmers, metal makers, hairless where the fire of the furnace has singed their forearms. As the blades are polished, the father and the child whoop with delight. A scythe, an axe, a wicked knife with a slightly misaligned beveled edge. Neither father nor child realize this until the judge says so, his feet an inch off from the gaffer tape on the floor. They nod sagely as if they did. They make guacamole for dinner. A mother puts on a fashion show. This is what they call it when they take turns trying on her old clothes from the 80s and pretend they will donate some. What if they come back into style? What if? They play music from Michael Buble radio on Pandora. The mother is the only person the child knows who uses Pandora. After the first song, it does not play Michael Buble again. The child does a spin in the mirror, floor crowded with discarded clothes. None of them are from today. They are all clean. The shoulder pads on the jacket are imposing, severe. The child feels as if they could, for once, confidently make a phone call to a stranger in such a suit, but let's not get too crazy. A child is a woman when she is alone. It's funny how it works that way. She has red fingerprints on all of her white furniture. Not in a blood murder mystery way, she has been playing with face paints, 
Her hands are smudged pinkish from washing. Her face is demonic, fun, not in a blood murder witchy way, just pretend. A woman is a woman when no one is looking. She's something else entirely when they are. I can't tell you, looking in your mind is still looking. Jiro, 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 an old man is staring. A young boy has one eye in the crack of a shoji screen. He doesn't realize a woman can see the rest of him. She pretends she can't. It's only polite. Thank you. Next in nonfiction, uh, Janine Willett. Hey, thanks, so, thanks, Courtney and Rachel for having me. It's great to be here. It's a really nice way to end an intense day. I'm coming to you from Minneapolis, um, the seat of the Chauvin trial. So we did something decent today. Yeah, I'm gonna read a, a fragment from my recently published memoir and fragments, it's called The Part That Burns, and this particular fragment is called Lucky Nine. Was it good? John asked. It was February, two months before my 21st birthday. Outside, the air was bright and taut with snow yet to fall. John and I burrowed under a blanket even though the old iron radiator poured soft heat into the bedroom. So much heat, we could smell the newly varnished floors. This wasn't my old cinder block apartment near the U of M campus, the first one I rented after foster care. This was a smaller but prettier apartment that John and I rented together now that we were together. Almost a whole year now. The apartment was on the third floor of a stately brownstone south of downtown. We could see the buildings of Minneapolis from our stoop. The neighborhood was rough, but I loved the shiny maple floors, refurbished tile bathroom, miniature galley kitchen. I loved the old glass and the paned windows, the way it modeled the world. Snow, I said to John, pointing to the window. Sharp flakes fell not in flurries, but one at a time, straight down. Hey, was it good for you, John said again. I sighed and pressed my head into his smooth, wide chest. He'd never asked this question. I didn't know how to answer. I kissed his shoulder. Hey, he said again. He wiggled his hand between his chest and my chin, lifted my face toward his. Was it good? Did you come? I wanted to press my face back into his chest, but he kept hold of my chin. One orgasm, he said, or more. I set my gaze just beyond his eyes toward his temples, which quivered slightly with his pulse. Two, he said, three. He smiled now, sat up four times. I let out a little laugh, one I hoped might sound like, oh, you big joker, you, aren't you silly, ha ha. But then John said, wait, five, six? We were too far out now, and it had happened so fast I couldn't possibly swim back. John's brown eyes trained giddily on mine, his naked body warm under the quilt, our legs still entwined. Snow fell faster than before, long straight lines to the unseen ground. Seven times, John lifted my chin again. Eight, I tried to move my head, but I was too slow. Nine, I grabbed one of John's hands in both of mine and pressed his palm to my mouth. I growled a little from my chest, kind of a gur gur like a small dog, I hoped just play growling in a friendly way. John whistled through his teeth and shook his head slowly, back and forth, back and forth. Nine times, he said softly, nine times. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God, I am cringing. <laughs> <laughs> Next in fiction, Pamela Huber. Hi. Um, this is the end of a story uh, that I finished recently about a um, Jewish mother and daughter who find themselves uh, among a Christian family in Delaware when they're from Long Island. The Christmas tree. But here down south, where not a single friend she knew would ever pay her a visit, she just kept waiting waiting for her daughter's arrival each day or for a monthly dinner with the kind childless men who rented her the apartment. Or maybe for a special treat, Steve would come visit with his kids from up north. Cramped, always cramped, yet never needing more space than the corner of the couch she is folded into. 
I think I need to sleep now. All right, mom. Laura wraps her mother's arms around her neck, tells her to hold tight. She lifts like the nurse taught her, sits her mother down in the wheelchair. She regrets all that hope she put in the new pills her doctor gave them a few months back when all they'd done was put her mother in the chair. She wheels Lila into the bedroom, lifts her into bed, tucks her in. The bed swallows her too. We should rent a movie this weekend, Lila suggests, a bit of that animation glinting in her eyes. How about Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? You loved those songs as a kid. Laura smiles. She does love that movie. So had Joe. Her mother only ever tolerated it, and so this gesture tugs at Laura's heart. I'll be in Maine with Dan and the girls this weekend, and the one after that. I told you that, remember? We go every year. Right, right, well, maybe when you get back. The light dims in her eyes now. Guilt knocks its wings against Laura's chest. Will I see you tomorrow? Laura asks. Laura kisses her mother on the forehead. The skin, thin paper she'd written a memory on once. She turns off the light. The waning orb of the moon can be glimpsed through the blinds, spilling its beams over the golf course. Laura, Isla asks. I'll see you tomorrow, Mom, with the nurse before I leave. After she descends the stairs, as she closes the front door and takes a gulp of clean night air, she catches it for real this time. From the direction of the Christmas tree farm comes the wisp of fresh pine fresh as the Catskills, as the edges of golf courses on the Cape, as summers in Maine with her husband. She breathes deep and lets it wash over her the smell of the North. She feels the urge to run back inside, claim a mulligan and hug her mother tight, to sing Chitty Chitty Bang Bang together off key, to wheel her mother out onto the balcony and swivel and spin her under the moon to take a nine iron and swing and knock a ball out into the night to be lost among the sands and ponds and turf, to be swallowed, to return home. Thanks. Next in poetry, Benny Heron. Ben metal, act still, be still. Trust only your legs, use them, stand firm, breathe deep, walk free, exist inward, cross waters, restructure, disembody, dis disassemble, organize, disengage, insist, be birth, engender, dissolve, deliver, let go, go back, be you, be her, be him. We've been on the moon. We've been on the moon or the moon been on us along with the earth and its crust. We dance dirty, made ham bone, spit it back to earth, dropped curls, then added a twist. Better than watching everything around you rotate in animation. We shape-shifted, like clouds became black without judging our form. We became lucid, neon Negroes shedding ghettos from their dermis, eliminating periodical static oracles in the name of our tongue, sending morphed codes to a bleeding Africa where two-legged animals dance like humans, chanting the roof is on fire, the roof is where we live, burn down them, they say, they that cough symbols into the European skulls forever slipping away between ritual and red stripe. We've been on the moon, or the moon been on us. We got racism in our throats. Our flim is America. We spit the truth, even when rituals leave us drunk off scripture, gathering at the belly of static oracles where sages stand in line to receive free, free fear. On the moon we did this, dying before we live, getting high on getting low. We borrowed fingertips to feel freedom beyond distance without warming and warning of a silence that became an explosion, a big bang or a big banger before the thing or the thought on the moon. And that moon, we've been on that shit. Next I think that is the best way to end this evening. <laughs> Moon. We've been on that ship. <laughs> Thank you, Benny. I don't know where I have. I have. 
So I was going to say a, a virtual round round of yeah. to all our readers, everyone. Karen, thank you again for kicking us off. Amazing artist, thank you for sharing your work. And everyone, oh my God, I love anniversary events because it's just like <laughs> everyone just brings it. This is what we get. <laughs> Sorry, I have dogs. Everybody throw your, your websites and your books and your instas into the into the chat. Um, and then follow one another. And we love you. <laughs> I don't know. I usually start crying at this point and get real sappy about how much we love you, but it's true. <laughs> None of us are going anywhere. We're still in a pandemic. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just killing time so everybody can get their info in the chat. Okay. I hear Sonder. He's standing on me. Um, we don't see him. Show us. Uh, now he's fighting. No, playing wrestling with his cousin, who is two times his size. Um, but simply, thank you, everyone, for joining us and celebrating with us. And we can't wait to celebrate in person. Hopefully in a year, our eight year will be in person. Courtney has a fantasy of an end of the year fundraiser, so maybe that would happen. I don't Courtney know. Does. Courtney does. <laughs> kiss you and rub our germs in each other's faces. I'm going to love you all up. <laughs> um, really, just an incredible, incredible group here tonight. Um, and, and people feel free to unmute and say goodbye. Yeah, or, yeah. Like or, talk to each other. I don't know. We miss it. <laughs> it's past my it. bedtime, but thank you all so much. This was so lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks everyone for the work you brought tonight. The visual work and the written work and just oh, it's such a great way to spend the evening. Mwah. Thanks, Indigo. Yeah, thanks everyone. It's uh, it's been fantastic to be in this space with everybody's work and energy. And um, thank you all for, for putting the whole thing together. Thanks, Adam. Indeed. Thank you, everybody. Oh. Peace. Thanks, everyone. Be kind to yourself. Have a good night. Hello. Everyone, you know, thank share. You so much. Everyone, thanks, Leslie. Thanks for the space. These were the first readings I ever did, and this was a really welcoming place to do it. So I Yay. appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome back anytime. Thanks for letting me be part of this tonight. Oh, it's a great community. I really appreciate it. So great to meet you. Send Karen, send St. Mary's folks our way. I will do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, thanks for a great end to uh, an intense day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Janine. Great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. You. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Love you, Leah. Can't wait to see you. Thank you. <laughs> what are we going to do with the next in person one? Is there going to be a. Hopefully, summer, we're going to reassess during the hiatus and hopefully do it outside. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, cool. <laughs> Maybe, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like the music references. <laughs> I know. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of them. <laughs> well, thank you all for so Thanks, Bill. Kira, you'd be so proud of me. I made a reel on Instagram. Ooh, I am proud of you, Rachel. <laughs> That's <Hey>. awesome. <laughs> so, like, a real zo Zoomer. You are in spirit. <laughs> Hi, Bill. I don't want to. I want to kick. People.